Hello, hello. Welcome to the uh, the first on-chain analytics masterclass. This could be a, uh, a raging success or a uh, or a complete flop. Let's uh, let's find out how we go. Um, when this thing comes through, just let me know I'm uh, I'm coming through okay on the chat room. Hello, hello. Welcome to the uh, first Ready Set Crypto on-chain analytics masterclass, guys. First one on uh, on realized capitalization. So this is a this is probably the most fundamental metric to really understand here, um, and you know to really delve in and find out when Bitcoin is over and undervalued. Uh, and I think it's probably the best starting point for uh, for really understanding what on-chain analytics can do for us and how it can add edge to our uh, to our trading trading strategies and and help us pick the market tops market bottoms so first thing is uh, a huge credit to nick carter anthony pierre willie Murad, and david who all uh, contribute their minds their energy and uh, their expertise to developing this thing um you know there's a lot of a lot of great open source content out there and there's plenty to digest so you got to give thanks to these guys who are really putting their expertise uh to work so um, I thought I'd start off by uh, giving an overview as to what on-chain analytics actually are. Um, and effectively, Bitcoin introduced a radical paradigm shift, which is uncensorable transparency. We can effectively see every single action that goes on on the Bitcoin ledger. Um, and all of that gets hidden um, or, or, or locked behind a, basically an impenetrable wall of the most secure encryption system that the world's ever seen. So. Um, the function of proof of work with the, the ever increasing hash rate um, effectively secures anything that happens on chain uh, immutably uh, forever. And we can effectively see all of those transactions. And when we start studying and understanding the behavior of Bitcoin in this regard, we can actually see what arguably the first digital organism to ever exist is telling us about the center of gravity for its network valuation. And the reality is Bitcoin is always, always just putting out information about where it is. Um, and there's an interesting side to, uh, to things where the on-chain information is things like transaction flow in BTC, things like hash rate, uh, things like uh, difficulty adjustments, all the things that contain who owns what and when, everything that's contained within the UTXO set. So that's what I re personally refer to as intrinsic data to, to Bitcoin. There's then the uh, external data that we assign to the Bitcoin network, which is things like price, things like date time. Um, Bitcoin doesn't know what day of the week it is. It only knows what block height it is. And we have to assign, because block times are not exactly 10 minutes, the link between on-chain information and what we use for things like price and valuation. We have to use the block time estimate to date time as our connector. And then we can start assigning things like, okay, what are the correlations between hash rate? What's the correlation between uh, transaction flows and probably the most common thing that we all look at, which is price. So how does the Bitcoin uh, network, how is it valued compared to how much it's used? So that's that's really the power of what on-chain analytics is trying to trying to resolve. So a little bit about Reset Crypto. Um, we're effectively a team of traders, analysts, educators, uh, and we are passionate about the digital economy, the opportunities of what Bitcoin and, and decentralization and, and how they just open up the world of global finance across all facets. No one really knows what this thing's going to look like in, in 10, 30 years, but all I know is it's not going to look the same as yesterday. So it's, a, it's an exciting uh, part, of the, part of the world to be involved in. Um, so for me personally, my background is a civil engineer, so looking at charts and spotting patterns is, is really my background. Um, and I'm the resident Bitcoiner at, uh, at Ready Set Crypto, and I'm there to pretty much challenge every other coin that uh, is in existence. So um, I, I really find looking at the, the background of what on-chain analytics does behind Bitcoin and being that it is the it is the primary asset where we can actually enjoy this luxury so far, nothing else really stands up to, to what Bitcoin does um, at the moment in terms of on-chain behavior. There's just no signals that we've been able to discern as yet. So um, I, I really think that on-chain analytics is the uh, a tool for the smart money, and it will be uh, moving forward. Um, and the usual pick, we're uh, we're not financial advisors here, so. 
uh, do your own research, understand the foundation of what you're trying to do before you make any decisions in the market. Because if you understand your own mind and you have your own uh, research down pat, it'll be the best decision you ever make. So a bit of a, uh, a flow about what we're going to go through today. Um, this session is on the realized capitalization. So basically it's a an answer to the market cap and some of its limitations. So we'll explore some of that. Um, we'll define what the actual market cap is uh, and how you go about calculating and establishing uh, the realized cap. Um, a bit of analysis that compares the market cap and the realized cap, which is where, where we can start to pull trends and signals that we can use in our uh, to, to find edge in the market, whether you're a long-term investor or in the, uh, in the trading space. Um, and then combining all that into one pretty neat ratio, which is your market value to realized value ratio. So that gives uh, some fairly clean signals that we can use to, to pick market tops and market bottoms with, uh, with fairly distinct accuracy, actually. So the main metric that most people are aware of is the market cap. So this is what we see on, on CoinMarketCap and uh, all those other ranking sites. Um, and it's effectively assumes every coin that is in circulation is available at the current spot rate, spot rate, and it's effectively circulating supply times whatever the last price was. So as you can imagine, as last price moves around quite a bit, the uh, the market cap shifts uh, equally as volatile. So effectively, your market cap will increase or decrease when your price appreciates or depreciates. And I see I've, I've missed a depreciate there, um, or where your circulating supply increases and yet price remains at least stable. Uh, that's where you'll get an increase in, in market cap. So effectively, it, it does assume that all coins are in, uh, in existence, and it is a, a concept borrowed from the equity space, uh, which is you know from, from stocks and, and shares and things. So um, this is the one where we're all fairly used to seeing uh, as the market cap in green, uh, and we can see there's a general trend of, uh, of increase that follows the, the Bitcoin uh, issuance schedule. Um, you can see the volatility um, and also probably worth noting pre-2013, uh, the data is fairly sparse uh, and then since 2013 we have a lot more data that comes in from the guys at Coinmetrics who are doing a great job of, uh, of releasing that information public for, uh, for us to use and, uh, and enjoy. So the real problem with market cap is that not all coins that have been mined and released are actually activating, uh, are act active and circulating. A lot of these coins uh, can be lost. Uh, they can, you know, in some of the other networks, they can get unclaimed or locked in smart contracts or bugged out. Um, or there's some coins that are just in immense deep cold storage and are actually not necessarily circulating and available at the spot price. So the assumption of all coins that are circulating or available for sale is not entirely correct. Um, and this does differ from equity markets where shares are never actually lost. They're generally held by custodians and can be reissued if needed. So it's a, we're in this interesting space and I'll talk about some of the uh, some of the challenges we're moving forward, but the concept of custodians and who actually holds bitcoins, um, that may also be something that changes in time. But effectively, the market cap is not a good measure for assessing the economic wealth that is stored in Bitcoin. What is the actual amount of value that is being stored in Bitcoin? Um, and the market cap is, is, is generally not a great uh, great measure for that. It tends to be uh, affected by things like emotion, affected by speculation, uh, hype cycles, uh, just being that, that volatile measure. So it kind of uh, gives lead to the to the realized cap. So the realized cap was originally produced by the team at CoinMetrics and it's effectively a response to these inaccuracies in the in the market cap. And instead of taking all circulating coins and multiplying by the last price, it effectively looks at each coin in the UTXO set in its final resting place as it is today and multiplies that by the price when it last moved. So what this effectively does is, is for example, Satoshi's coins, which are you know, a million coins sitting in a wallet, um, presumably they are sitting there with a zero price tag because they haven't moved since their, their inception and there wasn't really a price to assign to Bitcoin at the time. Um, coins that do get lost, uh, in general, Bitcoin's up uh, is in a fairly substantial uptrend and lost coins will most likely be at a lower valuation. And I do expect that over time, as Bitcoin gains value and we, we have this fairly significant amount of wealth stored in it, fewer and fewer coins will be lost over time. 
So those old coins that have been lost can effectively be, be removed from the uh, from the calculation of the realized cap here. Um, it's nice because it has a general applicability across both types of main cryptocurrencies, the UTXO set, uh, but also account chains like Ethereum that, that operate slightly differently. Um, it does have meaningful value and it doesn't deviate from the market cap by more than an order of magnitude. So it's still a, an appreciable uh, metric and, and, and use, useful for, for that comparison. And it effectively filters out a lot of the emotion, speculation, noise. Um, and one thing to note is it does ignore volume on exchanges and side chains. So it does remove a lot of the trading, the back and forward that's going on on, on exchanges. Um, but it also does lose some of the signal when it comes to side chains and even Lightning Network. So that's that's something that will be uh, an interesting interesting development as, as time goes on. So this gives you a bit of a snapshot of the difference in shape of the curve between the market cap in the green and the realized cap in yellow. And you can see the realized cap really follows a lot more of a stair stepping. It goes through periods of time where old coins come back to life, they're re-evaluated at a new price, and you get these increases in, in the realized cap. Um, either that or you have lots and lots of volume of new coins that are moving. So you either have fewer old coins which are now re-evaluated at a new price or you have lots of new coins that are now uh, mo moving around the network. So we do get these significant plateaus um, and it's a lot more of a stair-stepping pattern. Uh, whereas the market cap you can see fluctuates all over the place. It's got a lot more, a lot more volatility in there. But in general, both in fairly consistent uptrends and uh, useful to compare where those two lines sit relative to each other, which we'll go through later on. So what the Realize Cap does is it captures a fair network valuation considering all the active coins at the price when they were last moved. It's effectively an estimate of the price that the market paid for their coins. And you know, one way I think of it is the center of economic mass of what's stored in Bitcoin. It's kind of the average cost basis for the entire market. Um, if you took an average of everybody who's ever moved a coin, you're pretty close to that realized price and it gives a good, a good gauge as to what the market paid for their coins. What's nice about this is it gives us an idea about the aggregate behavior of both new and old coins. You get that impact of high volume of new or smaller volume of old coins being reassessed. Um, you can see when large volumes of coins are on the move or when people are you know, selling into strength or when they're drawing things off exchanges. And it can also be, I mean, where I think it's got uh, some of the most value is picking periods of over and undervaluation of the network. Uh, and that's where that comparison with the market cap really uh, bears fruit. So to kind of summarize all of that, the market cap assumes that all the coins are active and it equally weights each one, irrespective of where they sit, whether they're lost or not. And I look at the market cap as the speculative value, not the utilization of the network. It really is an emotive uh, trading type type uh, metric when it comes to comes to these crypto assets. Um, it is volatile, affected by price spikes, and really for low liquidity projects, it's it's not a very good measure for for the true uh, uh, true value of that that network, um, and generally overestimates in most cases, particularly in bull markets and uh, in the euphoria phase. Whereas the realized cap, it discounts all those lost coins and coins that are in deep cold storage and actually not for sale; they're not circulating. And it represents the wealth that is stored in Bitcoin. What is the actual store of value that is going on inside uh, within that network? Well, how much are people actually saving in the uh, saving in Bitcoin? And it basically filters out a lot of that noise and volatility. Uh, it does ignore volume on exchanges and side chains, and that remains to be seen how that plays in when things like Lightning Network really start to pick up steam and uh, and adoption. So a quick idea about how you actually calculate the realized cap. So I'll run through two examples, first one on a UTXO and then another one on an account type chain. Um, for those of you who are not super familiar, there's two dominant types of blockchain ledgers that in the market today. Um, the first one is UTXO, which is uh, Bitcoin, which is unspent transaction outputs, um, and effectively looks at each coin from the point when they're first mined and created, and it looks at the path that that coin follows to the different addresses as it gets sent along. Um, and it's basically a, cu a cumulative sum and say, okay, where do those coins un end up at the end of the day? Um, each address may have multiple UTXOs assigned to it. So if you send something to the same address, that address can have multiple coins, uh, effectively, or sets of coins that are assigned to it. Uh, and it's, it's generally straightforward to calculate the realized cap for a UTXO chain because it is just a sum from start to finish. 
When you come to things like Ethereum, which is an account-based chain, it functions a little bit more like a bank account. Um, you get a, it, it's a bit more of an incoming and outgoing. Individual coins are not so easily to keep track of, uh, and they and they kind of get mixed once they actually end up in the account balance. Um, so it's not quite as straightforward, and there's a few different tricks that they have to use to to really assess what the realized cap looks like. So anyway, we'll we'll start with the UTXO chain. So basically, what we're looking for is during each transaction, we're going to start with a single a uh, single point of 50 bitcoins just to show that it's a, a mining reward at a time when the price is 10 cents now through this flow when something goes green it's effectively a new utxo um, and if it's red it basically means that within this sequence of transactions it's it's an old coin or it isn't spent or used in this particular transaction so for this first case 50 bitcoins 10 cents five dollars worth of actual value the market cap and the realized cap are equal now, if we assume that they send 15 Bitcoins from address A to address B, you've still got 50 Bitcoins in this sequence. That Both of them are now in a new UTXO, one UTXO with 35, one with 15. So they both get reevaluated at the new price of $2. So you're, again, your market cap and your realized cap come out to 100 bucks. Now, this is where things get interesting. If we assume that the 35 Bitcoin don't move in this next transaction set, they will remain priced at 35 bitcoins at $2. So $70 in terms of realized cap. If we send those 15 bitcoin to three, doesn't matter how many, but in this case, three different transactions, each of those 15 bitcoins is now reassessed at the new price point of $1,000. So if we look at our market cap, our market cap is effectively just 50 bitcoins because that's all we have in the circulating supply at this point for this calc. Um, 50 bitcoins times your thousand, you get $50,000. But you can see that the 35 that remain there at $70 valuation actually bring down the realized cap quite significantly. Because they haven't actually moved, the price that that person actually spent for those coins is remaining at $2. So that's that's how that, that sets up. Now, if we assume that all of those, those new coins uh, effectively become old coins and don't move, you then have those 15 Bitcoins that are now continue to be assessed at the $1,000 price point. And a new UTXO comes through where it reevaluates all 35 and brings your $70 previous valuation up to 495K and 30K. So you can see what a massive impact it actually has when you move some of these old coins, reevaluating all 35 from $70 up to 15,000 it brings up your realized cap up to $531. So it, it really does show the power and the, the importance and why when the realized cap starts moving in, a, you know, in, in an up or a down slope with any significant angle, it does indicate that there's old coins moving and that could be selling into strength. It just gives us that, that piece of information about what some of these uh, these these big holdings, um, which, you know, generally lots of old coins at cheaper prices, what are they doing in the market? Because if you send those 35 and they were valued at a smaller fee, uh, sorry, you know, they were priced at a, an earlier price, um, you're not going to have much difference on the realized cap. Small retail traders have very little impact. It's really the big, the big movers that, uh, that, that move the realized cap around. Now, moving on to an account-based chain, there's a few issues. We said before, it's more like a bank account where you've got an incoming and an outgoing. It's a bit harder to keep track of individual coins. Um, if you think about a, a, a large Ethereum wallet, um, if somebody sends a dust transaction to it, you can't really calculate it as an incoming transaction and reassess because you could have 5,000 ETH that gets re-evaluated because you know, 0.01 comes into the wallet, which isn't, isn't quite realistic. Um, the other concept is do you do it when you send a transaction out? But you could have the same scenario where by sending a dust transaction, you re-evaluate the entire wallet, which is also... It, Basically, it, it would disadvantage UTXO chains. You wouldn't actually be measuring these on, a, on an equal footing because in a UTXO chain, only the UTXOs that are involved in the transaction are re-evaluated. So the solution is actually to treat it as a virtual UTXO where all the incoming coins are effectively new, treated as new, and the oldest coins in that wallet are used as the preferred set for any outgoing transaction. So effectively, if you spend something, you're going to spend the oldest coins in your wallet first. So this is kind of the, the, the workaround that you have to do to calculate a reasonable realized cap for account-based chains. So we'll just zip through a quick example. Start again with your, your 50 Ethereum, 10 cents. Um, 
you get a $5 valuation and your account realized value is five bucks. Now, if we assume we get another 10 Ethereum come in at a dollar, you then get your $10 uh, for that realized value for that transaction. And if you sum transaction one, transaction two, you get a realized value of the wallet of $15. So if we now assume that we send out a transaction of 15 ETH at a price point $20, you can see here that it's coming from the oldest coin set. So that 15 is coming off that initial 50 um, and you basically get a deduction of 300 where it reevaluates those coins at the new price point. So that's kind of how the, the, the UTXO set compares to an account based chain uh, for that for the realized cap calculation. So now that we kind of understand what it means, what the what the realized cap is uh, is calculated based on, um, we can start to look at how we can use this thing for a signal. So it does give us insight into market behavior of new and old coins, as well as what's going on on chain versus off chain. Particularly when you're comparing things to the market cap, which is on chain and off chain, to the realized cap, which is purely an on chain scenario. So the realized doesn't see all that volume that's going on in exchanges, only ones that are actually on chain transactions. So when your realized cap is increasing, it generally indicates that older coins that were bought at a cheaper price point are somewhat on the move. And it could be indicate that they're actually selling into strength. It could be that they're moving them to take advantage of a fork um, or upgrading wallet types or whatever else, uh, what other scenarios there are. But it gives an idea that some old coins that were bought potentially in the last bear market or earlier are starting to move. And because they're moving, they're being reassessed and it's therefore increasing the realized cap that we saw in that first calculation. Or the alternative is it could be that lots and lots of new coins, huge spikes in retail, and this is what we saw at the end of 2017. Um, when you get the euphoria phase, lots of new coins are moving, which can also bump that uh, realized cap uh, north. Now, during bear markets, what's quite interesting is we tend to have stable and flat realized cap. And what that generally tells me is that we've got a lot of um, low on-chain volume. People are not really sending things or, or buying Bitcoins as a, as a genuine payment system because um, it's effectively losing value. Um, and the older coins, in my mind, have most of them would have sold into the strength. And that's why you're getting the increasing phase and the euphoria in the bull market. It's actually the older coins that have already basically sold and, and, and sold off their positions. And they are remaining fairly stationary during this phase. Uh, you know, it's, it's at least one theory and way to appreciate it. And what we then see is during the capitulation phase or the accumulation phase, whichever side of the coin you want to be on, um, your realized cap tends to have a slight decline. And again, we're basing this on, on one to two bear markets so far, but this is what we've seen that we get a slight decreasing. Um, makes sense because your, your spot price is below your realized price. People are generally underwater. Um, there's generally a, a significant volume of people selling those coins. Um, you know, a lot of the time at a loss. So you are getting a, a decline in the uh, the realized cap, although generally it's, it's it's fairly shallow. Now, if we were ever to see a very steep decline in the realized cap, that would indicate that some very, very large holdings in terms of volume, not necessarily old coins, because old coins are most likely from a, a cheaper price point, at least the way that Bitcoin is, uh, is trending at the moment. If we do see a steep decline, it actually means there is a significant loss of faith and it, it would probably be a fairly significant move. So generally we see shallow declines, but if we ever see a very steep realized cap decline, it could be a, a fairly significant sign. So now if we start looking at uh, identifying some of these market cycles on a, on, a, on a macro scale and how we can use the realized cap, we'll start with the 2015 bear um, and in the disgust phase. So. It effectively starts at the end of a euphoric period. You see that you get your massive spike in the realized cap and your market cap. Um, and in general, through the, the, the bulk of the bear market, your market cap is higher than your realized cap. So your realized cap is generally flat. Um, it, it, it's generally old coins have already sold into the strength, which is that near vertical uh, realized cap uh, mark. And really the bear market is dominated by traders and, and, and new investors on exchanges, right? It's people swapping coins back and forth, but really not investing for the long haul because they're just consistently losing value. And you come through to your capitulation or accumulation phase. So this is where the spot price or the market cap falls below your realized price or realized cap. 
And this really means that the market is almost entirely underwater. On average, on cost basis, the market is now underwater. People are now selling at a loss. Um, you get a slight depression in the realized cap. You can see there's a slight downward angle. And historically, this has been effectively the best buying opportunity in, in the decade. So um, really, that's that, when you get that drop below, um, this is where you start to get some, uh, some, some real value. And uh, you can see what's quite interesting is that during the discussed phase, the realized cap effectively acts as a support, which makes sense. It's your break even point. It's a logical spot for the smart money to actually be buying, uh, buying in. And then it also acts as resistance because all those retail traders and people who have bought in during the discussed phase, picking that bottom, and now just trying to sell to get their money back. So you end up with a point where it's, it effectively acts as overhead resistance uh, through the, uh, the accumulation phase. So as you move into the disbelief and eventually the acceptance phase, um, what I've noticed is quite interesting is that your market cap will accelerate at a higher angle of attack than your realized cap, um, which to me kind of indicates that a lot of the smart money or the large whale accumulation has already occurred in the, in the capitulation phase. Um, and really a lot of this is being driven by people who are just starting to get on board and you know, it, it really does sum up the, the disbelief that we're not getting that much movement in large volumes or um, old coins selling into strength um, because your realized cap has a fairly shallow angle. So it, it, it's more of a speculation and, and price discovery phase, uh, which is shown by that alpha there. And then eventually you inevitably end up in the uh, euphoria phase, which is where you tend to get a, a an alignment between your realized cap and your market cap grade lines. And to me, this is this is the smart money actually selling into strength. Um, a lot of those older coins from cheaper price points are now being reevaluated, sent to exchanges, and then sold into market strength. So that's really what tell, it tells me is going on here. And uh, one thing that is probably interesting to note is the um, the zone here, which is effectively where we've got the um, Bitcoin Cash um, forks that was going on. So people were moving their coins to take advantage of that. Uh, that, that phase. So you can see a lot of those older coins actually bumped up the, uh, the realized cap uh, during that period. And then invariably you rinse, repeat, and you do it all over again. So what's interesting to me is that we, uh, during that April 2nd spike in the uh, in Bitcoin price, we actually punched right up through the realized cap, which effectively, uh, you know, as far as history tells, um, ended this capitulation phase and in theory bumped us up into the next, uh, next uh, bull cycle. So that's, uh, that's one of the huge metrics that, that really got people excited. So starting to look at these four different market characters and how we start to establish macro symbols, uh, so signals for, for how we can you know, improve our edge and, and, and trading base. Um, through the discuss phase, you can liken it to a volatile and trending downtrend. Um, your realized cap tends to be relatively flat um, and it tends to act as support for the, for the market at that time. So old coins generally are fairly stationary during this period. It's mostly on, on off-chain uh, volume occurring on exchanges, trading between you know, new participants and, uh, and traders, um, and less going on in terms of the, the hodl phase. During the capitulation phase, you end up with a bit more of a sideways and quiet, sometimes sideways and volatile, but it's effectively a shallow downtrend in the realized cap. Um, coins here are basically bought and sold at a loss, uh, and the smart money is really accumulating at this point at these uh, cheaper price points. Then you move into your disbelief, acceptance rally. You start to move into a quiet and trending uptrend um, in the equities world. I'm not sure they'd call it quiet, but it's a uh, it's certainly more of a stair-stepping pattern. And you get a shallow uptrend. So the, the realized cap takes a little bit of time before it accelerates, uh, which again, to me, is that the older coins are actually, that they, they've done their accumulation. The accumulation phase was, uh, was, uh, was significant. Um, what I think will be interesting in this next market cycle is that we didn't have as long. And I think that the... Uh, the accumulation phase was a lot shorter than people were expecting. So if we do start to see an acceleration of that, uh, of the realized cap, to me, it actually says that we're still getting large scale accumulation going on. So I think that's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting comparison to the 2015 bear. And I don't believe it's going to uh, occur exactly the same. And the euphoria rally where effectively the market cap goes parabolic. Um, and we end up with a realized cap really steepening up, which to me is the uh, it is the market and the old coins selling into the strength uh, strength of the market. 
um, and also combined with lots of large uh, large volumes of new retail investors uh, buying basically buying the top and uh, and transferring to their wallets only to uh, to catch the disgust phase shortly after. So we can extend this study. And because we've basically been looking at the comparison between the market cap and the realized cap, um, we can basically create a you know fairly fairly simple ratio, which is the MVRV ratio, or market value, market cap, uh, divided by your realized cap. And the way I look at this is the speculative value divided by your stored value. So what is the actual amount of wealth that's stored inside the network versus what do people think that the network is worth? What is, what is the speculation side of things? So what the ratio really provides us is a tool to identify the divergences in this network valuation. It helps us discern between speculative value and stored value, um, high versus low time preference, st strong and weak hands, um, and really exuberance and uh, uncertainty. So it gives us a bit of a, a measure as to what's going on there by combining these two. And effectively what you're looking at here is at, at a point of unity where the MVRV ratio is one, your market cap equals your realized cap. As soon as it drops below one, it means that your market cap is now dropped underneath your realized cap, and you end up with a scenario where you're in capitulation. And when your market cap exceeds by many, many um, orders of magnitude your realized cap, your MVRV ratio is very high, which can indicate a market top. So we're going to have a look at how this actually plots out. So what you can see is your market cap in green, your realized cap in yellow, you can see your MVRV ratio, which is just the, the ratio between the two in, in white. So there's two boundaries that really show up here. Um, the first one is your basically a point of unity or where your market cap equals your realized cap, which is effectively once it drops below that, your MVRV ratio drops below one, market cap reduces below realized cap and you end up in the accumulation phase and really has represented historically the best buying opportunity. Now, this measure of MVRV equals one is probably going to remain a fairly constant number because it, just from a rational perspective, if your speculative value is now less than the stored value, you're in a, a phase of capitulation. Now, it can keep going deeper for sure, but it does indicate that the market is now on spot price valued less than what is actually being, it is actually being utilized for, which is that store of value. Now, historically, We've seen this metric here of the 3.7, which is indicative of a blow off top. Now, we have to be careful here because this is based on two data points, really, 2013 and 2017. So when it pierced through that 3.7, that's really where we had the, the, the euphoria phase. Now, I would expect that in time, not only will, I don't think too many people will be looking at this, but certainly more people will be looking at, at on-chain metrics. Um, I do believe that the, the actual peak and the point that represents a blow off top will become somewhat of a target. And I think that it will probably start to actually decrease with time. Um, now I've looked at a few different coins on this and they all have different characteristics, but the one that remains is when your MVRV is, is one or below accumulation, that's a fairly constant measure. The blow off top and when it actually is too high will be both coin specific and also time specific. So it's not gonna be a, a perfect measure, but it certainly gives us an idea uh, based on past history where we're at. So again, boiling this down into how we can use the MVRV ratio as a, as a signal. Um, effectively, your sell signal at your market tops is where your market cap is significantly higher than your realized cap. There's a high degree of speculation in the market. Your realized cap is much lower than that and really representing the utility means that the actual utility of the market is far less than the market value. It's currently in an overvalued state and historically has looked like something of an MVRV of greater than 3.7. Likely to change in time, I would suspect that it will, it will, that will decrease with time. Now your normal behavior is effectively your bull and bear. If you're in a bull market, your MVRV is effectively trending up. If you're in a bear market, it's trending down. Um, and your realized cap is generally a strong support level. Uh, so it will it will act as that support uh, through the system. And historically, we're between 1 and 3.7 for the MVRV. And once you move into the accumulation phase, that's effectively your buy signal. Uh, your market cap drops below, and your spot value drops below. It's effectively an oversold condition. 
Um, you realize cap sits above that and tends to act as a resistance level where people who are buying the dip, buying the dip, buying the dip, and they are trying to exit at all costs. And this really represents where your, your network's utility is actually greater than the market value, which means that your the Bitcoin network is effectively undervalued when the MVRV drops below one. And I do believe that will remain a, a fairly reliable level moving forward because it just makes sense that if, if we are in fact mapping out where the Bitcoin network is, is undervalued, um, the amount of wealth that's stored inside it and what we've seen before is that the, the, the strong hands tend not to be selling at this point. It tends to be people who are buying during the bear market that are now selling at a loss. Uh, you know, I, I think that will remain a fairly, uh, fairly consistent measure. So to kind of summarize and, and, and wrap this all up, effectively the, the market cap is a measure of the spot value of the Bitcoin network. It assumes that all the coins um, uh, in circulation, it is affected by things like emotion, speculation, and what's going on on exchanges. Now, the realized cap is an alternative metric which uses the on-chain behavior, looks at the actual transactions that are going on within the Bitcoin network, what is it actually being used for, and is a much sounder measure for the wealth that is stored in Bitcoin, and really it represents the average cost basis of the market. When your realized cap uh, is pierced by your, your your market cap and it falls below, it effectively means the average cost of the market is now underwater uh, and people will start selling at a loss. It's capitulation. So you can basically compare your realized price versus your spot or market price and analyze these in the MVRV ratio and it can really help to identify those macro market tops and, uh, and the accumulation phases and so far with relatively high confidence, particularly for the uh, capitulation. So if you understand what these signals and patterns that appear in the market cap, realized cap, and MVRV ratio, it does give you a lot of insight into the movement of old coins, new coins, smart money, retail money. And I believe that understanding what this, what was going on behind the scenes here is really what's going to define the smart money in the, in the next phase. And being able to really pick the, these macro shifts um, of market tops, market bottoms, and uh, I think will be a continually... Uh, important metric moving forward. So just to close out on what some of the challenges are in terms of the, the realized cap and, and understanding how it all how it all works, um, the Bitcoin market and the crypto landscape is constantly changing. Uh, the signals and levels will become targets for the smart money. So that's what I mentioned before with that MVRV of 3.7 will be a target. Uh, and when it hits, I would, I would very much expect that there would be a, a, a reaction in the price. Um, and off-chain transactions are not accounted for by the realized cap. And it is important because we're, the, the Lightning Network and sidechains like Liquid are all starting to go live, and they will eventually build increasing uh, levels of adoption. And what we see here is that you've got these payment networks that exist on top of Bitcoin that process you know, arguably hundreds to millions of transactions, but are represented by a single opening and closing of a channel. So you have far fewer on-chain transactions that are actually representative of large, um, you know, large transfers of value. So it is going to be interesting to see how this this evolves. But we're still in the early days of uh, of Lightning Network and Liquid and various side chains. So we will we will see the impact as this changes over time. And again, this is why you know I, I think the the understanding of on-chain metrics will be a a variable process, and uh, it's not something you can kind of set and forget. There's a constant learning uh, learning phase that goes on here. And the, there's, a, there's going to be a change in the dynamic between what's going on in exchanges um, and the old school buy and hodl type approach. Um, the reality is that custodians and exchanges, um, they do function as crypto banks um, and they're going to become increasingly important uh, as Bitcoin becomes more financialized and, and, and mainstream. Um, the reality is that the risks associated with private keys and self-sovereignty aren't for everybody. So people will continue to use these custodians and banks. Um, and a lot of the, the, the network, um, a lot of the trading volume and, and exchange that goes on within these custodians is not going to be on chain. They won't be paying the fees. It will all be occurring internally or via side chains like Liquid that are connecting these different institutions. So there are going to be uh, developments on this front. And uh, then there's also the, the secured lending markets, which I think is also going to be a fairly substantial part of Bitcoin's history, which is where 
you know people can can utilize the the value that's stored in their bitcoin um held at various custodians to actually leverage that and and uh, and create credit markets so i think that's going to also be be part of the financialization that will that will affect what goes on uh, on chain so a few challenges but um things to, to kind of keep an eye on as uh, as things evolve so there's some resources, so I'll um, I'll circulate for our Omnia members um, at Ready Set Crypto. Uh, the, this is a PDF. Um, a few of the the acknowledgments of the guys who have uh, have actually worked on this. Um, there's some great charts by Coin Metrics and uh, and Willy Woo, where you can actually map out these things and, and assess these things in real time. Um, so you know, a, a huge thanks and uh, an acknowledgments to those guys for their for their work and, and expertise. Um, that effectively closes out the, uh, the, the this first first episode. Um, I'll open up everything for for questions, and if there's you know questions, comments, complaints, or if you want to throw tomatoes, go for your life. Um, and in the meantime, I'm, I'll uh, jump across to the Coin Metrics um, page, which is effectively, in my regard, the probably the soundest and best um, measure to actually look at the realized cap and some of these on-chain metrics. Um, what's really cool is you can actually set up your own functions. You can establish, you know, whether you want to look at price in green, we want to look at the realized cap divided by circulating supply or the realized price, um, which is shown here in the yellow. And then you can plot your Bitcoin network value by your realized cap, which is effectively your MVRV ratio that we talk, talked about earlier, um, which then plots up here in the black. Um, and you can actually plot this across all number of coins. You can look at any, basically any coin that's supported by the Coin Metrics uh, website, and you can keep track of when your, you know, when your realized cap drops below your, um, sorry, your, your market cap drops below your on-chain, uh, your, your realized cap, and um, you can keep track of this thing. And I think the reality is you don't necessarily need to be watching these metrics at the same rate that you would with technical analysis. It really is valuable in spotting the macro shifts and the, the, the changes in trend. Um, but to not keep your eye on these things and, and, and you know, combine them with the you know, various transaction volumes and, and everything else, um, this will give you a lot of edge in, uh, in understanding what the Bitcoin network is doing, what the market is doing. Um, and I, I think we'll, pay, we'll bear fruits as the, uh, as the next cycle plays out. Um, there'll be a lot of people who certainly will never look at on-chain analysis. Um, there's a lot of people who are, you know, basically will just buy the buy the next market top. And uh, I, I do believe that there's an opportunity to be to be ready for that when it does come uh, come along. So that's it, guys. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for tuning in. Um, if there's any uh, any questions to come through, more than happy to answer them. Um, there's uh, this is something that we're going to be building out a lot more in our uh, in our Omnia service for for Ready Set Crypto members. So um, I'm excited to really build this into uh, into our newsletter and and start looking at these on chain metrics and uh, and how we can use them to to better find edge instead of just doing technical analysis. This really is the first financial asset in the world that we've been able to actually do arguably technical analysis on the fundamentals, which is uh, which is pretty cool. Patrick, so you asked, how would this work with the cycle theories? So, um, granted, I'm not super familiar with the cycle theories, although I, I, I believe that this is effectively the cycle theories visualized. Um, what, what's really exciting to me about things like the, the realized cap and, and market cap is it effectively shows you when the market is underwater. Um, you know, there are assumptions. There's assumptions based on the, the concept that the realized cap is the, you know, the price of the coin when it last moved. Um, but I do think that it, it, it tells you, it's telling you when the market is underwater. And I think there's a huge amount of value that you can get from just spotting that, right? If, if, if the whole market is, uh, is losing money, it represents a point of undervalue. So, you know, I'm sure that the actual calculation may evolve, uh, you know, as we start to see these side chains come live. But, you know, I, I think it's basically a visualization of, uh, of the cycles in real time. Um, so Taig, so has the MVRV ratio shown to predict price in any other assets or is only applicable to crypto? Well, the reality is we don't have the uncensorable transparency in basically any other asset. So Bitcoin really introduced this whole concept of, you know, um, being able to audit 
in real time everything that's on the ledger. So we've never actually had this level of transparency before to, uh, to map this out. So um, I, I think this is a first. Um, one thing that is important to note is that, you know, these metrics really haven't evolved yet for uh, a lot of the other assets in the space. Um, and that's not necessarily for any reason other than Bitcoin is the most organic asset uh, that's, that's, you know, um, actually found a real utilization in, in this space. So um, it's not that the patterns don't exist. It's not that the formulas are different. The numbers and, you know, what the actual peak MVRV ratio is, is, is the same. But um, even looking at the patterns between your market cap and your realized cap, the same obvious patterns haven't quite, uh, haven't quite come forth. Um, I think Litecoin is one of the few coins where you can get at least the market cap, realized cap comparison. Um, but once you start looking at things like NVT ratios and, and exchange volume versus uh, on-chain transaction volume and all that kind of stuff, once you delve further into the on-chain metrics uh, analysis, you really can't discern the same patterns from, from any other asset. Bitcoin is really where it's at at the moment. Um, and to me, that's actually a hugely bullish sign and, uh, and shows uh, just how important Bitcoin is because it, it is an extremely organic network. Um, but uh, yeah, look, I, I think to me, uh, it is a bit sad that the accumulation period is over and uh, we can certainly we see, see that the price, price reacted to that, to that reality. reality. Um, you know, you know where, where it goes from here, here, who knows? But, but uh, you know, we're slowly starting to see. See if we can zoom in. We are starting to see a slight uptick in the realized cap, which indicates that people are now buying and transacting, therefore moving things off exchanges um, at these newer price points. It's not a huge. It's not a huge dip, but that's certainly a lot steeper than what we've seen elsewhere. That's a change in trend, and to me, that is that is confirming that there is indeed. Um, buying and holding coming off exchanges there is some degree of that occurring uh, at the present time so you know there's a few, there's a few other metrics and once I, uh, once I run through the, uh, the network transactions NVTs and um, what I like to call the RVT which is basically your NVT but using your realized cap um, you get a lot more information about what's going on so this is actually people transacting at new price points um, but is the volume actually there so yeah, I think there's, uh, there's certainly a lot more that we can, uh, we can delve into and that'll uh, be the subject of more modules. So how can we use this in relation to what price is doing now? It seems to realize Cap's telling us the price is a bit overvalued. Can we expect a pullback? Um, big echo. Sorry guys, let me... Uh, is that better? Do we have... Uh, have we lost the echo? It's still no good. No echo, still the same. Oh, okay, well, glad we got through uh, through the majority of it. Yeah, not sure why we've uh, we've lost that, but um, just to kind of close this out. Um, no, okay, there we go. Uh, all better. Good, good, good. Okay, we're in action. Um, how can we understand? So, so to me, what, what what I see today is that this uptick is important. This is saying that people are now starting to pull things off exchanges. Um, at the, they're buying and moving at these higher price points. Um, what I would like to actually map out um, in the in the next module is understanding what's actually going on under the hood in terms of transactions. So, um, what I've seen of late is that there's a lot more transaction volume. In fact, we can actually map this guy out. If we were to map out your average transaction volume, no, hang on, transaction volume, and you compare that with your exchange transaction volume, put these on the same axis, yeah. No, hang on. Okay, so this is looking at, in the present day, um, in the area plot is our exchange transaction volume, and in the solid red plot is our on-chain transaction volume. So it's only recently 
that we've actually seen. So this is the 2017 bear market. Um, before this, there was a significant difference between exchange, where exchange was much, much lower compared to on-chain. Um, during the 2017 bear market, those two effectively collapsed onto each other. So we actually had a, a, a fairly strong match between on-chain and uh, on-exchange volume. And as of the start of the accumulation period, where we had that capitulation in December, we actually got a decoupling where the exchange volume is, is markedly higher than what is going on on chain. So to me, that actually tells me that there's a lot more volume going on on exchanges, most likely with a degree of leverage involved um, and probably aligns with what uh, Turdemista came out with the um, from Adam and Capital talking about Bitcoin and heavy accumulation. And I do believe that there was a fair amount of accumulation going on in exchange trader volume that was not being pulled off exchanges because there's going to be the uncertainty as to what's going on. We're now starting to see that volume start to pull off, which aligns with the realized cap starting to kick up. So I do think that there's a, uh, th th there is certainly accumulation. I do think that the bear market is over as a response to this, um, but there's a lot more things we can uh, we can delve into to understand whether a pullback is actually necessary. Um, you know, markets do whatever they want, but uh, there's certainly things we can look at to uh, to delve into it. Um, question here, do I think the exchange volume is much higher because of people's trust in exchanges? Um, I don't necessarily think that's the case considering uh, recent events with Bitfinex and, and Binance. Um, I think people's trust in exchanges is, is misplaced at the best of times. Um, what I do think is that people are now getting to the point where they've made their investments and it's coming to the point where they're not expecting it to now dump back below 3,000. I think people, and this, this is representative of the bottom being in, there's a representation of, uh, of initial FOMO at the starting of the bull run. Um, and yeah, look, I, th I think that the, uh, the accumulation potentially may continue, but um, you know, uh, I think that the exchange volume is telling us that there's certainly been a, a, a strong period of accumulation since, uh, since December. Okay, I think that pretty much wraps things up. Um, thanks guys for your time. Hope you, uh, hope you drew some value out of this. Um, I've got a few more modules coming up. The, uh, the next one will be on um, scarcity modeling, so looking at stock to flow ratios. And uh, this is based off a lot of the work that, that Plan B has done. Um, so some, some really interesting models that actually look at how gold and silver compare to, to Bitcoin and, and uh, you know, how it is in fact fulfilling with almost incredible accuracy the, uh, you know, the, the, the metrics uh, or the, the measure of valuation that you could predict. And uh, what was fascinating is that you could predict Bitcoin's price at the very least at the uh, at the realized cap levels, um, based solely off the first four years of uh, of data. So you didn't even need the first halving, and you could have predicted the price uh, the price floor today, which is uh, fairly interesting. And then the next one will be on uh, uh, transaction volume. So looking at the uh, the NVT ratio, which is kind of the equivalent of the price to earnings. Um, and then a new metric that I play around with, which is the uh, the realized um, the RVT, uh, with some uh, some interesting corrections applied. So, look forward to seeing you all there, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for your time, guys. Bye.